Welcome to Healthcare Du Jour, where we dish up and digest the latest in healthcare. For the next 30 minutes, sit back as we bring you insight, commentary, and discussion on trending topics to the table, all expertly served up by our host and his guests. Healthcare Du Jour is brought to you by Carium, the telehealth platform enabling healthcare's digital transformation, helping you care for people within the fabric of their daily lives. Now, here's your host, Matt Fisher. Welcome back, and thank you for joining as we dive into the hottest topics in healthcare. I'm your host, Matt Fisher. On the menu today is Tony Lemo, CEO at BioDot. Welcome, Tony. Hi, Matt. How are you? Doing very well. It's great to have you on the show today. And Tony, what I always like to do before getting into the main part of my conversation is to let my guests provide a little bit more of an introduction in terms of who they are and what they do. Uh, So the floor is yours. All right. Well, thanks. So um, BioDot is the world's leading provider of of systems for point of care diagnostics marketplace uh, for manufacturing of of tests in particular. Uh, We've been in business for almost 27 years now, uh, providing our systems and services to the world's leading IVD manufacturers uh, and and uh, life science companies, so, and I've been with the company since 2006, um, and and now CEO. Uh, my background is actually in chemistry, uh, analytical chemistry to be specific, so more of an instrumentation uh, background, um, and that's come in real handy over the years at Biodot. So, kind of, what first brought you into the healthcare industry, um, coming from that chemistry background? My first uh, job out of graduate school was actually at a pharmaceutical company, Glaxo, before they became GSK. So I was working in uh, an analytical sciences lab, and then I transitioned into a, a very exciting drug discovery R&D group. And I just you know, decided that that was where I felt like I had the biggest chance to make an impact. It was in the R&D uh, side of, of the business, and I liked the pharmaceutical you know, industry and, and um that was a good landing spot for me. And then uh, not too long after that, uh, we were developing some very interesting ways of doing high throughput drug discovery. And those those interesting ways got noticed by people outside of, uh, of Glaxo. And so my, I decided to leave and start up a business with a person who uh, was the founder of Biodot. So my first interaction with Biodot actually began in 1996. Um, left and decided to become a small business entrepreneur, and uh, I guess the rest is uh, the rest is history. So, yeah, and you said you know kind of now that you're focused on uh, diagnostic testing. So, could you actually provide a little bit more of a, a description in terms of what that kind of covers and you know how that fits into the overall system? Because it's you know obviously it's something that's become a bit of a, a popular topic uh, given all the testing uh, discussions and, and complications and challenges that have arisen around COVID. Yeah, sure. So, so Biodot provides equipment to to the developers and manufacturers of rapid diagnostic tests. That's the primary market that we serve. We also serve other markets related to healthcare and in clinical diagnostics, uh, molecular diagnostics, and life sciences. But with respect to the point of care rapid diagnostics uh, market. Um, People buy our equipment to to develop their their uh, their tests um, for starters. They also will buy our equipment if they've already got a test developed and they need to to scale it to manufacturing levels. So we provide uh, bench top systems for R and D and low volume production, and all the way up into large scale production systems that are capable of making you know hundreds of millions of of diagnostic tests per year. So we're really the go-to provider for people when it comes to producing their tests at scale. And we've been, you know, supporting this industry, as I said, for almost 27 years. So we're, you know, we're well connected to all the world's leading manufacturers of these tests on a global basis. So, and when you're talking about the, the production of diagnostic tests, kind of what's the, you know, for lack of a better way to say, it, the, the nuts and bolts process of developing and then scaling out a new test? Yeah. So, you know, from the development perspective, there's obviously a lot that goes into um, the assay design from a, from a reagent perspective, chemistry perspective, um, molecular biology perspective. That's not really, you know, our expertise, but that, that clearly resides within the developing man, the developer companies themselves. They understand the, the, um, the required parameters for developing a test that would be usable in a rapid format. What, where we come into play is providing the dispensing capability. So these these reagents, whether they be antibodies or um, antigens, reagents of interest, have to be deposited onto the, the the materials for these tests. And and the typical material for these tests is a 
nitrocellulose membrane uh, in, in this sort of lateral flow format that people are familiar with today. Uh, so the reagents have to be deposited in very small quantities uh, in very specific locations onto the nitrocellulose membrane. And that's what our equipment um, has been designed for um, since the beginning of our, of our business. That's been our core competency is ultra low volume dispensing uh, and ultra um, precise and accurate uh, locating ability for where those reagents are deposited. And you're just, just you know talking about reagents and, and you know, how that's part of the, the testing process. Can you, can you actually be able to just, kind of just describe or define what a reagent is? Because I suspect not many people might know what that specifically is. Yeah, the typical reagent when we use that word in these types of tests is some sort of uh, capture antibody. It's a it's an, a molecule that's been identified as being able to specifically bind to the analyte of interest. So, you know, in the case of a, like a COVID, it's designed to match up or bind with some portion of the spike protein is the typical uh, the typical one that's used. So it, it's designed to bind to that. And it also has a what, what's called a conjugated material at- associated with it so that it turns color. It in some way identifies itself as having been um, captured when it captures that that material. So it's either a color change um, or something that you know that triggers a reader if it's a reader based test. So it's specific to the target of interest. If it was uh, you know if it was flu, it would be something designed to specifically target the flu. Uh, if it's if it's strep throat, it would be designed to specifically target streptococcus. So it really depends on the test. Uh, if it's pregnancy, it's you know looking for um, HCG. So it just depends on what the test is. But there's something that's specifically designed, and then it's bound to the membrane through a deposition process with a with a system that Biodot would sell. And then your sample is uh, introduced, and as the sample makes its way up the test, it will bind to that test line based on that capture antibody. And now you have a signal that can be detected either visually, uh, you know, or optically through a reader. So in kind of how is the development process? Of, is, it, is it something where you have to create the reagent or, you know, kind of what's that? How do you know when you have the right reagent for the particular, I, I guess, target that you're looking for? Or um, I think you said protein that you're trying to bind. Yeah. So the developers ha- have some understanding of what those targets look like um, and they will go through through a series of, of um, you know, research studies to, to try to identify the most um, specific form of, of an antibody that can bind. And then you typically have to isolate that specific form and um, have it manufactured at a large scale as a, as a what's called a monoclonal antibody. So it's, it's actually grown up um, cellularly and it's designed to be very specific uh, and sensitive to that particular analyte. So they'll go through a series of experiments to find that out on their side. They have some knowledge of the target and what might be a, a suitable property to bind you know, very strongly and specifically to that target. And that's really the expertise of the developers. That's where, you know, their their knowledge of molecular biology uh, comes into play. And, and that's really their domain expertise. How quickly does it typically take to develop a, a new reagent to, to drive the testing? Because it's, you know, I'm just thinking with COVID as the you know most recent example, you know, it, it appeared like testing was able, able to be developed relatively quickly. So was that on a faster than usual timeline or was that kind of... It, it was faster than usual. You know, what, what happened with... So to answer your question initially, it, it you know, probably takes six months, maybe longer um, uh, to get... Um, a, a test developed in a normal circumstance. Again, that's a broad range. It, it might be faster for some diseases that are better understood. It might take longer for something that's more novel. COVID was a little interesting because it was based on SARS primarily. And because of the impact that COVID was having on the on the world, the there was rapid sequencing. So the whole, you know, SARS CoV2 was sequenced. And the sequence domain information was published broadly on a global basis. So people had an opportunity to, and the scientific community had a chance to really understand how to develop something faster because the whole sequence was was made known quickly. Uh, and that allowed people to target certain regions of, of the SARS-CoV-2 and, and probe it in such a way that they could make a more um, specific uh, uh, you know, test on a rapid time scale. And so, yes, it was faster than much faster than normal. So was that kind of broad public sharing of, of the sequencing atypical for the industry? I, you know, I, I'm, that's not my area of expertise, but my understanding is yes, that's more atypical. 
you know, it's typically something that, you know, is a little bit more uh, protected in, in, in many instances, particularly for, for some some of the more novel diseases. But I think there's still pretty good open communication in the scientific community in general um, in, in the testing world. It kind of circling also back to a lot of what you're talking about, which is, you know, that this is kind of point of care rapid testing. Right. So what does that actually mean? Um, you know, kind of, and, and what are the, and how does that differ, differ from other types of uh, tests that can be run? Yeah, that's a good question. So you know, the rapid, the rapid testing name generally uh, is attributable to tests that can be performed in, in 15 minutes or less. That's the generally accepted um, definition of rapid. I think some people stretch that a little bit. But that's the generally accepted definition. And you know, that compares and contrasts to laboratory-based tests, which the, the classic one for, for COVID comparison, as uh, I'm sure you're aware, is the PCR test, which is a laboratory-based test that takes typically several hours to perform the assay because there's an instrument-controlled thermal cycling process that has to occur to amplify the, um, the, vi- the virus that detect- that's present uh, to the point where it, it's able to be detected. And that takes special equipment, usually done in centralized testing facilities. So in, um, for the lab testing, you just said PCR, which I know has uh, been thrown around a lot, as you said, for COVID. Uh, would you mind just kind of explaining what that is to make sure that everyone fully understands? Yeah, so PCR is based on an amplification uh, technique where a, a virus, for example, is is present in a sample, and through a series of reagents, again that are added, that the, the molecule is identified and and then replicated or amplified. So you can have a very small amount, you know, maybe as as small as a single strand of of viral material that can then be amplified to to you know tens of thousands to millions of counts. Um, and, and therefore be able to be detected. And, and that's a process that's, that's been around for a long time in molecular biology, uh, polymerase chain reaction, PCR. It's an amplification, uh, an isolation and amplification process. And so it makes the test very sensitive, extremely yeah, yeah, yeah. sensitive. Yeah, and kind of what you just said in terms of you know, making it more sensitive was going to go to the, my next question, which is, I, I feel like I've heard a lot in, in the news that the PCR, the lab testing, is more accurate. And it sounds like that might just be based upon the fact that it's getting more granular into the sample that was collected. It has a, yeah, it has a higher sensitivity or a, a, another way to describe it is it's got a lower limit of detection. So it can, it can detect you know, a single strand or a small number of strands, whereas with an antigen test that you hear about in the rapid format, you might need tens of thousands of, of, of viral particles to be able to be detected just based on the fact that there is, you know, limited uh, sample prep. And of course, there's no amplification present. So uh, the good news about PCR is it can detect very, very small loads, uh, viral load. The problem that people have with PCR when they, when they talk about it is it doesn't necessarily tell you whether you're actually actively able to infect somebody. You can you can test positive by PCR weeks after you've actually initially contacted a virus. In this case, you know COVID. So there is that challenge um, that it, it tells you that you have viral particles in your body, but that you're not necessarily able to spread those. Whereas an antigen test, it you know if it detects viral particles, it's almost certainly detecting them at a point in time when you are actively able to transmit. So that's why there's there seems to be almost two camps that have developed the the rapid test camp and the PCR camp and the rapid test camp is arguing that the value is you can detect people while they're actively able to do most harm and spread whereas PCR that's not always the case you may have you know people who are positive but are actually not a threat to spread the virus so antigen tests rapid tests could be used to 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 capture these potentially sp- potential spreaders early and allow them to take protective measures such as, you know, you know, quarantining and things like that. So. Yeah, no, that's a very interesting distinction. And kind of, as you said, the, the fact that with the PCR testing, the, the positive, the positivity rate can be detected for a longer period of time. You know, right. you know I, I know like my wife is a physician, so I've heard her, you know, she's told me it's like, you know, she's had patients who have been positive, gone through their whole course, and then it still shows up weeks or even months afterwards just because the virus happens to linger in the system. But as you said, that doesn't necessarily mean it's still infectious. Correct. That's right. And so that's, you know, there can be some, you know, misleading characteristics from from that perspective, uh, from the, you know, 
population's concerned. So, and, you know, PCR is a great test, but you cannot perform it on a large scale cost effectively, right? That's the other challenge. It certainly is a, uh, you know, all things being equal, it's a more sensitive test, as we said, but it's just not practically scalable to populations, whether the populations be, you know, students at a university, whether the population, you know, is a, a, a local you know, area in a community, whether the population is an entire country, you know, you certainly can't scale PCR. The, the preparation time, the instrumentation required is just not suitable for that. Whereas antigen tests, rapid tests in the format that are used today also have the major advantage of being scalable. Uh, the cost is sufficiently low that they can be broadly distributed. In fact, as you're probably seeing now, they can actually be administered at home without the without the assistance of a physician. So that opens up a lot of opportunities that are significant in, in providing better access to, uh, you know, to, to diagnostic testing from a healthcare perspective, which is, I think is the attractive aspect of these you know, so-called rapid tests is, is that a- aspect the um, broad distribution and potentially at-home use. Yeah, no, I think those are very good points. And for those of you just joining, I'm talking with Tony Lemo from BioDot, um, talking about diagnostic testing and um, kind of some of the things we've learned through COVID. And kind of with that idea, you know, were there particular challenges or opportunities um, that were seen as a result of COVID that can be used to help, from your perspective, future um kind of evolution of diagnostic testing or preparedness for kind of the next uh, healthcare event? Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, there's two, two major areas I, that I think have, have um, will have you know, several, several benefits beyond COVID. Uh, the first is the innovation that took place in the industry from a development perspective, from a test format perspective in the face of the COVID crisis is, was, was significant. Uh, the industry had always been uh, talking about you know, being able to have, you know, for example, reader-based assays or uh, assays that could be assisted with the use of a smartphone, smartphone apps. Because that's, you know, that's something that everyone, you know, broadly speaking, everyone is familiar with now is an app ecosystem, right? We're all used to going to our smartphones to, to, uh, to, to, to get information. And so the ability to have a smartphone provide direction to someone on how to take a test is important. You know, you could actually click through on a wizard you know, format, and it'll tell you how to actually administer the test. That's a huge advantage to the to the um, to the end user to be able to have a test that can do that, because that's one of the concerns that has always been raised about broadly distributing these types of tests. You know, from beyond a physician's control, is how do you get people to a provide sy- symptomatic information? Did I have a fever? Was I in contact with someone who might have had this? You know, that sort of background epidemiological information is really critical. It's actually essential in the case of COVID. So how do you enable people to, to to capture that information so the healthcare industry knows that? Well, you can do that with an app, and that's where the smartphone app ecosystem is helpful. The second part is having um, what I would call more reader-based assays, uh, where the, the, the user is not required to interpret the result directly, but there's a an interpretation made for them. That could be from a reader that's actually detecting the signal on the test and it's using its own um, built-in algorithms to detect to, to, to basically tell the user that they, you know, that they have either a positive or negative result. And that information can also directly communicate typically by Bluetooth back to a healthcare provider or to the healthcare community at large. In the case of COVID, you know, epidemiological information can be gathered. Those are huge advances that have taken place that um, will really open the door for things beyond COVID. You can easily imagine flu being the same in the same uh, kind of format. Anyone who has, you know, ever had kids and wondered whether their child who has a fever has the flu or not would love to be able to have a flu test and be able to determine whether it's the flu or whether it's the quote common cold. And now you can throw COVID into the mix. Is it COVID? Is it flu? Is it strep throat? Is it something else? Well, if you have access to tests at home, you know, as an example, that really allows people to have confidence um, in, in their ability to you know, take care of their own health care. It also provides physicians with differential di- diagnosis capabilities. You know, telemedicine has really become prominent as a result of COVID, which is another uh, related area. And if you're a physician asking someone to describe their symptoms, wouldn't it be great to say, okay, I want you to take a flu test, a COVID test, and some other test, a pneumonia test, and tell me whether, you know, we'll, we'll find out what the results are. So you don't have to go to the physician to get a test. The test can come to you. They can order the test or they can be uh, picked up at a pharmacy. 
And now you can actually administer healthcare remotely in a very effective way. So those are huge advances that COVID has really ushered in. And, you know, there's permission space now regulatory wise to allow that on a, on a broader scale. I think you've probably seen some at home tests have now been authorized. And that's a big step forward for broader access to, to diagnostics and healthcare for the patient population. Yeah. And kind of that, as you said, the, the development and rollout of, of that at home capability certainly seems to align with a lot of the other components of the healthcare industry where it's trying to get more, I, I hate to say direct to consumer, because it's still, as you said, tying into the, the rest of the healthcare ecosystem, but you know, more meeting the patient where they are and Correct. allowing for, I think, as you said, the expansion of delivery beyond uh, you know, the traditional walls of a hospital or uh, you know, physician office, which you know, I think, as you said, can help with that ease of access and Correct. also, you know, the uh, you know, the, the, I think the expansiveness of, of what can be offered. Yeah, that's right. That's the right way to think about it, in my opinion. You know, it, it's it's access to healthcare, and access to healthcare is is has to be cheaper when someone can take a test at home than if they have to go to a walk in clinic or an emergency room. The cost associated with that is significantly higher than if a test can be conducted, you know, at home or as a lot of people have probably done now at, at even a, a drive through facility in a parking lot somewhere is still a lower cost healthcare uh, test than if it was administered in a, in a, you know, in a physician setting or in a hospital setting. The other area I was going to mention when you asked, you know, what else has, has come from COVID, the second area really is the, is the scale up or the recognition for the need to scale up for the ability to produce tests like this on a larger scale. Um, you know, COVID has, of course, necessitated that. There's a lot more capacity in the industry now. There's still not enough capacity to to deliver on the promise of uh, decentralized rapid testing on a global scale. But But there's been significant investment in the infrastructure required to produce tests on a larger scale. And that's you know, that's very important, um, obviously, for healthcare, And uh, it's something that the industry has has really needed for a long time as well, is that uh, that that, uh, that drive to be able to have more broad scale production on a global basis. And having that broader scale production, does that also then kind of feed into the last point that we're talking about of the availability of at home testing? Since theoretically, if people have access to that at home, maybe they're going to want you know, maybe test more frequently or that's right. test more broadly because they, they don't have to go somewhere and maybe they'd be more willing to pay for it out of pocket if um, they have that option as well. Yeah, that's right. And that, that's what I think the next step will be. That's, a, that's really, a, I'd say, a, a, a quantum leap uh, in terms of production capacity that would be needed um, to support, you know, again, I, I, I would, I wouldn't say direct to consumer, you know, as you, you know, paused when you said that, but it's almost a direct to consumer model. It's much closer to a direct to consumer model than it probably is today. And that's either a physician orders, let's say, you know, four or five COVID tests to be taken daily for a week, much like you'd get with an antibiotics pack, you know, you, you get it in a packet and you take one a day uh, or, you know, so it's not direct to consumer, but it could actually be. I mean, there's certainly cases now where um, you can get sample collection kits on Amazon. It won't be long where it actually is direct to consumer. And that will require a significant capacity buildup uh, in, in, in this, you know, in the manufacturing part of these tests. Uh, but it's, it's an investment that I think companies will recognize they can get a return on. And that's, been one of the one of the major drawbacks uh, in the industry in the past is these rapid diagnostic tests have been viewed as um, low cost and therefore the margins have been low and the reimbursement rates have been low and so the desire to invest in scaling has been low uh, from the industry perspective that's also been turned on its head now as a result of COVID and I think there's going to be some real advances in uh, manufacturing capabilities as a result of the fact that people have made this renewed investment. So there are exciting uh, changes in the industry that I think will bring better health care to, to the population of the world. And we should all be you know, thankful if there's anything to be thankful for in this COVID situation. It would be that, that better, better health care is coming. And we're not going to go back to the way uh, health care was being conducted you know, prior to COVID, which is great news for everybody. Yeah, no, I think those are very fair points. And, you know, as you said, it's, you know, there has to be that kind of cost benefit analysis around it. And it's, you know, well, unfortunate because you always want to think of healthcare and the drive of the industry being to, as being what's best for the individual, you know, kind of still at the end of the day, it's a business. And it's, you know, I feel like I've had this discussion with many people. It's, you know, because it's a business, you still have to make sure, 
you can get make money or make smart investments because otherwise you know you're not going to be around for uh, the long haul. Uh, but believe it or not, we're actually already very close to the end of our time. So kind of picking up on the last point you made of of one silver lining. Would just like ask ask you for a concluding thought in terms of what do you think was the most unexpected uh, benefit that's come out of the COVID pandemic? I think it's related to this topic, and to, to me, the, the most unexpected and positive outcome is the the, the um, recognition that testing, you know, at home is actually a viable alternative, and I think that's the benefit that will probably have the longest impact um, in the in post COVID is that. Is that change that the ability the recognition that testing at home is important and and once consumers have that option they're going to not want to go back because unlike physicians who might want to know whether you're actually sick or not you know individual people will be asking different questions it's you know can my child go to school um i need to take a test can i go to the super bowl this weekend i have a ticket can i go can i get on an airplane to travel um very different questions that we'll be asking as as consumers and i think the ability to have those questions answered through this you know at home testing process is going to be hugely important and it's uh, it's a great outcome yeah no and i think a great thought to have is the the parting um idea to take away cuz as i said believe it or not we are out of time i want to okay. thank my guest tony lemo for a great conversation today <laughs> Yeah, thank you. I enjoyed it. And thank you to everyone listening. Keep the dialogue going and connect with me at hashtag H-C-D-E-J-U-R-E. I'm Matt Fisher. Until next time. 